propositions, probably some of you already know by memorization. Tonight, Brother Guy Wood is going to be doing the affirming. And that first proposition reads, The scriptures teach that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, does not actually, bodily, literally, or in his own person, dwell in the individual Christian. It is Guy's obligation then to to affirm that the Holy Spirit does not personally, in person, or actually, or literally dwell. And please keep that in mind, what one is affirming and what the other is denying. We will now be turned the uh, mic over to Guy in Woods for his first affirmative of the evening. Friends, I rejoice that in the good providence of God and through the invitation of the eldership of the church in this community that I'm privileged to be before you tonight in the defense of the proposition which in a moment or two we shall identify and define. I have met uh, given Blakely for the first time this uh, evening and my first impression is that if we could transfer from his face to my head that which grows there, we'd both look better. <laughs> I am to affirm tonight this proposition. The scriptures teach that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, does not actually bodily, literally, or in his own person dwell in the individual Christian. It seems to me that this is so obvious and so clear in what it says that it really needs no definition but to follow the usual procedure. Let me quickly say that by the scriptures I mean of course the Bible. By the word teach to say so in so many words are to lead to that conclusion by proper deduction. The Holy Spirit is identified in the passage by the uh, Opposite statement, the third person of the Godhead does not actually bodily, literally, or in his own person dwell. Seems to me to be so obvious and clear in its meaning as not to need further definition. And in the individual Christian is the locale or the area in which I deny that the Holy Spirit actually bodily or literally dwells. Now this is the theme that we shall be discussing. I am the affirmative tonight and uh, tomorrow evening I'll be in the negative following the speeches that will be made on the other side of it. In keeping with our agreement entered into, we're to submit uh, some questions and I shall present them in the very outset of this speech. Number one, since, and these are written questions and I'll have a copy for uh, the Blakely in just a moment, uh, and Brother uh, Price will pass it over to him just now if he wishes to do so. Number one, since Christ's earthly body was literally, actually, and personally indwelt by deity, the second person of the Godhead, and since you claim that your body is actually, literally, and personally indwelt by deity, the third person in the Godhead does this, in this respect, now observe that emphasis, in this respect, make you equal to Christ. If not, why not? Number two, is the statement, the Holy Spirit is deity, and quote, to be personally indwelt with the Holy Spirit, is to be personally indwelt with deity, end of quote, true or false? Number three, is the following statement true or false? Quote, Given Blakely believes that only one-third of the Godhead really and actually dwells in the individual Christian, and the other two-thirds of the Godhead, the Father and the Son, are not really in the Christian at all. End of quote. Number four, Is it true that one without a literal, actual, and bodily indwelling of the Holy Spirit is as obtuse and dense as the apostles were before they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, though they had the words of Christ. Number five and last. 
since you believe that the Christian cannot understand the scriptures without a literal, actual, and personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit, does this mean that the alien sinner cannot understand the teaching of the scriptures about what to do to be saved without a direct operation of the Holy Spirit? If no, does this mean that you think that the Bible can be understood by unbelievers without the Holy Spirit, but not by Christians without the direct indwelling of the Holy Spirit? If not, why not? Now these are the questions that uh, will be dealt with, we assume, in the first speech that will be made uh, in the negative. Now I should like uh, for us at this moment to uh, put on the screen chart number four, and the lights will be turned out. And I apologize for this, but in an audience of this size and an auditorium this large, it's simply not possible to make the charts clear throughout the entire assembly. And in order for them to be seen at all, it's necessary for the lights to be turned up. So our chart number four, and the lights out now, on our screen. This will give you some idea of what the position that we are, uh, are defending in this uh, uh, debate. Uh, <clears throat> while we're getting this ready, let me point out to you that my view and that which I am defending is that the Holy Spirit takes the Word and by means of that Word exercises an influence on the heart of the individual. That it is done by the Spirit by means of the Word. Now to represent the position that I'm opposing properly and correctly, it is also believed that this occurs, but that this is not sufficient. That in addition to the exercise of influence by the Word, that there must be and is a direct impact of the Holy Spirit on the individual. And that without this additional impact, there is not and cannot be an understanding of God's Word. Now that's the essential difference between us. I do not want to misrepresent the opponent. He believes as I do that the Word exercises an influence and that the Spirit does so by it. But then the difference between us is this. I argue, and I shall prove it by the Scriptures, that this is the sole influence by which the Spirit exercises power upon the individual. He believes that this is simply not sufficient and that it takes an additional influence, which is the Holy Spirit. Now that's the position, and I think we're not getting it uh, before you on the screen as clearly as we'd like. And consequently, we'll just simply use a few more words to explain it in that fashion. So we may have the lights back on now in order that we may be able to uh, see a little bit uh, better here. So let's turn the lights back on. Someone might ask, well, what is the reason for this debate? What's the importance of it? Since it is simply some difference over how the Holy Spirit dwells in us. If that were the sole difference, there really would be but little significance in it. That is, other than the fact that all people ought to want to know what the Bible teaches. But there are implications that grow out of this that are serious indeed. And that is this. The concept that there are influences wrought upon us in addition to and apart from the Word simply impeaches the authority of the sacred writings. Now watch. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, every scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, I'm quoting from the American Standard Version, may be complete, completely furnished out of every good work. But get it now, if there are influences wrought upon us in addition to and apart from the Word of God, then it takes the Word of God plus plus these alleged additional influences in order for us to have all that God has for us. In which case, the word is simply not enough. But it says it is. Is it? If I cannot rely upon that statement upon which one cannot. Now watch. 
The statement says that the man of God is complete. Item number one. Completely furnished unto every good work. Item number two. That simply means this. The word meets my every need. It puts into my hand all that is necessary for me to have in order to my full acceptance before God. And secondly, it likewise gives me that which is entirely adequate in the discharge of my responsibility to others. It not only fits me, it outfits me. And yet the position, regardless of what may be said, on the opposing side is that the word is not enough, that one cannot understand it, which is really the logical view. It is one of the heights of absurdity for men to claim an operation of the Spirit apart from the Word or an actual literal indwelling, and then as some do, turn right around and say that it does nothing for you. That is to impeach the usefulness of the Holy Spirit, is to say that notwithstanding the fact that He's literally in you, that you still got to detour Him 2,000 years back to a uh, beginning and then 2,000 years back down in a book when he's there all the time. Don't you know, friends, if the Holy Spirit were literally and bodily and personally in us, he'd tell us what's right and he'd warn us against what's wrong. He would uh, teach us all things that we need to know as he did the apostles. And in this fashion would meet our need. Yet this man believes, and some do, that you have to detour the Lord back the Holy Spirit back, as well as the Lord, 2,000 years in order to get what he has for us. I reject that, and I'm glad to say that my opponent in this debate rejects that uh, ridiculous aspect of the subject that some among us today hold, and does believe and will attempt to prove that the Holy Spirit helps one to understand. He'd say that it illuminates the Word. But bear in mind, please, that it was the Word that... Uh, that the Spirit gave in the outset. Did he fail in his work? If his word, which he originally gave, is not clear enough and has to be illuminated, then how do we know that the illumination is sufficient? Maybe we need to illuminate the illumination that illuminates the word. Where do we stop? This is an impeachment of the authority and value and effectiveness of the word of God. Now here is the statement upon which I base these uh, charges with reference to given Blakely's position on it. I quote here from him, from his paper, The Word of Truth, the fourth quarter, 1985. And here is the quotation. We ought to emphasize that the scriptures are not to be studied like an earthly textbook. The words and concepts that are contained there cannot be discerned by merely subjecting our minds to them, although that is imperative. These things are spiritually discerned, that is, comprehended through the assistance of the indwelling uh, Spirit of God that authored them, 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. This is what makes understanding understanding. Uh, it is not something that is accomplished by our earthly capabilities alone. They must be invested with extraordinary attitude from above. Now that says, and that's the end of quotation, that says in effect this, that the word by itself cannot be uh, approached or utilized to find out our duty to God without a direct operation of the Holy Spirit, or at least by this indwelling of the Spirit which he will contend for this evening. That is pure, simple, unadulterated Calvinism. Nothing more, nothing less in basic significance. I stood on this very platform 40 years ago and debated a primitive Baptist who in principle argued exactly the same thing except that their phraseology was different, the approach is the same. That man is dead, incapable of understanding the Word of God without a direct operation of the Holy Spirit upon him. This is what this man is contending for. This is the logical position with reference to an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He's doing what he ought to do. His error is not at this point. Of course, it's a grave one to deny that the Bible is adequate. His grave error is in arguing that the Holy Spirit, apart from the word operates, I challenge him to produce one single solitary thing. 
that the Holy Spirit does uh, to us that is not specifically said to be done by the Word of God in the sacred writings. And so he's in grave error on that point. Now, at the expense of being a little bit tedious, it seems to me necessary to clear away some of the uh, possible misapprehensions that may arise. I want you to be on your guard with reference to such accusations as this. Well, you really don't believe in the Holy Spirit dwelling in us at all. Now, that'll be a false statement. I shall show you in what sense, and of course the book so says that the Spirit is in us. In what sense that's so? He will tell you that I do not believe in the operation of the Holy Spirit upon us today, or that the work of the Spirit was limited to the apostolic age. This will be incorrect too. Let me point out that it is our view, and we can easily sustain it by the sacred writings, that in the conversion and sanctification of the individual, that the Holy Spirit is in the inception of it, in the carrying out of it, and in the consummation of it. All by the Holy Spirit, but by means of the word which he gave. Secondly, he'll tell you that I do not believe that the Holy Spirit is in us at all, because I believe that he's there representatively. He believes that Christ dwells in us representatively and is so, uh, has so said, or at least has indicated such. If his conclusion with reference to the Spirit not being in us at all, this would mean that he doesn't think that Christ is in us at all, though the Bible so affirms. Now let me point out further. It'll be worthless waste of time for him to repeat passages that tell us that the Spirit is in us. There is no question about that. It's not a question of the fact, it's a question of the mode. It's not if the Spirit dwells, it's how he dwells. Now get this please. We read for example in Romans 8 11, the Spirit dwelleth in you. We're told in Romans 8 and 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's not of his. It is said in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. These passages are sort of fact. They do not indicate a mode. Bear in mind that the question is not, does the Spirit dwell? But how does the Spirit dwell? Does the book say that the Spirit is in us? Yes. Now the next question is, and that which must be debated, is how the Spirit dwells in us. And if he shall continue, and it's easily possible to do, to pile up passage after passage that asserts that the Spirit is in us, there's no argument about that. He'll be wasting his time and ours in so doing. There are 16 locatives in the, new, in the Greek text of where it is said that, the, uh, were, that Christ is in us. There are eight instances where the Father is said to be in us. There are six instances where it is said that the Holy Spirit is in us. So, the book tells us that the Father is in us. Look at it, 1 John 4 and 15. Whosoever confesseth that Jesus has come in the flesh, God dwells in him and he in God. That says the Father is in us. The book plainly, clearly declares that the Son is in us. In Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you the hope of glory. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, Paul said, Christ liveth in me. So the book says the Father is in us, the Son is in us, the Holy Spirit is in us. Now nobody has any problem with the statement that the Father is in us. No one thinks that that means that there is a literal portion of the Father that has taken up his abode in our physical bodies. Nobody thinks that. Everybody properly understands that that means that the Father is in us as his will controls our influences, our lives. Nobody thinks that the Holy Spirit or that the Son is in us literally, actually, and bodily, that he's no longer in heaven but has returned to the earth and divided himself into as many portions as he has followers, literally injecting himself into each. Nobody does that. Everybody understands that when it is said that the Son is in us, he's in us as his teaching influences and controls our life. But 
in recent years, there has been a tendency to accept the view that because the book says the Spirit's in us, that he must be in us in some mysterious way. Think about it. Number one, Christ was in a body and therefore incarnate. These men teach that the Holy Spirit in a human body makes that human body incarnate. Christ was an object of worship because he was incarnate. Does Gibbon Blakely believe that he is an object of worship because he thinks the deity resides in him? Thank you.